Actress Sharon Tate was eight months pregnant when she became the most famous victim of Charles Manson's drug-crazed followers. At 8.30 on August 9th, 1969, a middle-aged black woman pounded on the door of 1050 Celio Drive, located in the foothills above Los Angeles. The woman was Winifred Chapman, housekeeper two doors down at the rented home of film director Roman Polanski and his pregnant wife Sharon Tate. Mrs. Chapman was screaming hysterically. Householder Ray Ayson came to the door with his 15-year-old son Jim, and they made the call to the Los Angeles Police Department and thus revealed to the world what the state's prosecutor would later call the most bizarre, savage, nightmarish murder in the recorded annals of crime. Bodies on the lawn. When the police arrived at Celio Drive, a substantial mansion set in its own grounds, they found a scene of appalling carnage. In a car, parked in the driveway, was the bloody body of a young man slumped over the wheel. He had been shot four times. On the lawn were the bodies of a man in his thirties and a young, dark-haired woman in a nightgown. The man had been shot twice, struck over the head 13 times and stabbed a total of 51 times. The woman had 28 stab wounds. Both were soaked in their own blood. Fearing the killer might still be around, police entered the house through a back window. In the living room, they found two more bodies. A young blonde woman, dressed only in a flowered bra and panties, was lying in the fetal position in front of the fireplace. She was heavily pregnant. She was also soaked in blood. A white nylon rope had been looped around her neck, over a rafter, and then around the neck of a man who lay four feet away. He had a bloody towel over his face and his hands were still raised, as if protecting his head. He had been stabbed seven times and shot once. The pregnant woman had a total of 16 stab wounds, five of which would have been fatal on their own. On the lower part of the front door, the word pig had been roughly printed in what tests would later prove to be her blood. The woman was Sharon Tate. Before they even knew who the victims were, the police had a suspect. Approaching the guest house on the other side of the swimming pool, they heard a dog barking and a man's voice saying, Shh, be quiet. Police burst in and found 19-year-old William Garrison. He was the caretaker hired by owner Rudy Altabelli to look after the guest house while the main house was let. Garrison said he'd been there all night and heard nothing suspicious. When police took him on a tour of the house to show him the mayhem he'd failed to listen to, he was unable to identify any of the bodies. Dissatisfied with this story, the police placed Garrison under arrest, but within 24 hours they were forced to release him after he passed a polygraph test. The LAPD were left with the bloodiest of jigsaw puzzles. By now the bodies had been identified. The man in the room, roped to Sharon Tate, was Jay Sebring, 35, an internationally known hairdresser. The couple on the lawn were Wojtek Frakowski, 32, a Polish-born playboy and friend of Roman Polanski, and Abigail Folger, 25, his girlfriend, and heiress to the Folger coffee fortune. The young man in the car was Stephen Earl Parent, 18, a delivery boy who'd visited Garrison that night to try to sell him a clock radio. What was missing that night was a motive for their slaughter. Ritual slaying. The press were screaming ritual slaying after someone got hold of the incorrect idea that the bodies had been found with hoods over their heads. They also highlighted the fact that Sharon was found only partially clothed and that Sebring was her ex-lover. There were suggestions of a sex orgy that had ended in death. But the police were looking for more solid motives. Robbery seemed unlikely. There were money and valuables lying around the house in plain view. None of the victims had been sexually assaulted, but drugs including marijuana, hashish, cocaine and hallucinogenic MDA were found, and autopsy reports later revealed MDA in the systems of both Folger and Frykowski. So, police theorised at this early stage either a drug party freakout in which someone had gone crazy and killed, or a drug deal gone wrong. They also entertained the possibility of deaths by hire but there were flaws in all these theories. Outside the property, the phones had been carefully cut. If it was a drug freakout, this could only have been done after the murders, which made no sense at all. 
Also, how could one person possibly have wreaked so much carnage? On the other hand, the very strange savagery of the attacks told against the idea of a professional killing, so the police were left with a drugs burn. In fact, so convinced were they that this was the result of an argument over drugs or money, or both, that they totally ignored one lead that could have led them to a solution to the case within days. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Office, working quite separately from the LAPD, had arrested a hippie musician called Bobby Bosalil on the 6th of August for the murder of music teacher Gary Hinman. Hinman had been brutally stabbed to death, but, more significantly, the words political piggy had been written in blood on the wall of his home. Bosalil had been caught driving Hinman's fate with the murder weapon still in the car. The LA Sheriff's Office told the LAPD that their suspect lived with a bunch of other hippies on the Span Ranch, an old movie location in the Simi Hills outside the LA suburb of Chatsworth. Their leader, whom they seemed to believe was Jesus Christ, was a man called Charlie. But Sergeant Jess Buckles, assigned to the Tate killings, wasn't interested. We know what's behind these murders, he told the detectives. They're part of a big dope transaction. Horrific killings. That same night, the LAPD would have another horrendous double murder on their hands, but even the seemingly glaring similarities to the Tate killings wouldn't be acknowledged for another three months. At 8.30 p.m. on Sunday the 10th of August, the day after the discovery of the five bodies in Celia Drive, 15-year-old Frank Struthers returned from a boating trip to his home at 3301 Weirverly Drive near Griffith Park. There appeared to be no one home, though the blinds were down and his mother and stepfather, Rosemary and Leno Labianca, would have been in. He called his sister, Susan, and together with her boyfriend, Joe Dorgan, they found the spare key and entered the house. Leno Labianca was lying on his back in the living room floor, in his pyjamas with a bloody pillowcase over his head. Around his neck was the flex from a heavy lamp tied tightly enough to have strangled him. His hands were tied behind him with a leather thong. He had been stabbed repeatedly in the abdomen with a knife, and from his stomach, an ivory-handled carving fork still projected. Carved in his flesh was the word, war. When police arrived, they found Rosemary LaBianca in the bedroom. She was lying in a pool of blood, her short pink nightgown and a dress she appeared to have put on over it, bunched over her head. Like her husband, she had a pillowcase over her head and a lamp flex tied tightly around her neck. She had been stabbed 41 times in the back and legs. In the living room, high on one wall, was written in the blood the words, Death to Pigs. On the opposite wall, in front of the door, was the word, Rise. On the door of the refrigerator in the kitchen, also in blood, someone had written, Helter Skelter. But almost immediately, police rejected the idea that the same killers might be behind the Tate and the LaBianca murders. If anything, they thought the LaBiancas might be a copycat, and when it was found that Leno, president of a chain of LA supermarkets, had gambling debts, they started to work on the theory that it could have been a mafia hit. And still, no one was interested in connecting either case to the Hinman killings. That Saturday, the police did raid the Span Ranch, but they weren't looking for murderers. They were running down an auto theft gang who'd been stealing VWs and converting them into June buggies. The raid was not a success. All 26 suspects had to be released when it was found that warrants had been misdated. Among those arrested and then released was a 34-year-old ex-con man out in parole. His name was Charles Manson. Broken gun grip. Meanwhile, LAPD's separate investigation into the Tate and LaBianca murders was making little progress. They had 25 unidentified fingerprints inside the Tate mansion. They had three pieces of a broken gun grip, also found at Celo Drive, and these were identified as belonging to a special high standard .22 Longhorn revolver. A description of this quite unusual weapon was circulated, but no information ever came back. They also found a buck knife down the back of one of the chairs and a pair of spectacles. None of these clues had taken them anywhere. The drug connection was making little progress either. Four drug dealers who had been frequent visitors to 150,000 Silo Drive were prime suspects for a while, but 
were later eliminated when three proved alibis and another passed a polygraph. As for the Lubyanka detectives, they simply had no leads at all. Fear among Hollywood luminaries who had been friends of Sharon Tate was rife, as they began to think that they might be next on some maniac's list. Frank Sinatra wasn't hiding, Maya Farrow was too frightened to attend the funeral, seals of guard dogs and guns for personal protection rocketed. Then, on October 10th, 1969, police and Independence, a town five hours north of LA, mounted a raid on the Barker Ranch. They were investigating an arson attack and a series of car thefts, but local rumour also told them the stories of a crazed band of hippies called the Manson family. The first raid resulted in ten women and three men being arrested. Two babies, both with severe sunburn, were also discovered. Police recovered a number of stolen vehicles and a store of arms, including a submachine gun. Manson arrested. Two days later, police went back and arrested seven more people. Searching the primitive bathroom at the back, one officer noticed long, dark hair hanging out of the top of a tiny cupboard under the wash basin. When challenged, a man dressed in buckskin came out, cracking a joke about the cramped space. He was booked in independence as Manson Charles M, aka Jesus Christ, God. Among the young girls picked up in the Barker raid was Kitty Lutzinger, 17, a girlfriend of Bobby Bozalel, who was already in custody for the Hinman murder. Kitty was five months pregnant, frightened, and asking for protection. She told police it was Manson who had sent Bozalel along with another one of his followers, whom he'd christened Sadie Mae Glutz. The plan had been to extort money from Hinman, an ex-family member, but when he refused to pay, Bobby stabbed him. The police had a hard time working out whom was whom after the Barker raid. All the girls seemed to have a bewildering range of aliases, but eventually they established that Sadie Mae Glutz was really Susan Atkins. She was booked and sent to the Sybil Brand Institute. Los Angeles women's prison, and it was there that she began to tell her bizarre story to fellow inmates who were soon calling her Crazy Sadie. Sadie bragged of her sexual exploits, a first degree murder charge, to anyone who would listen, but most of all she talked to two ex-prostitutes, Virginia Graham and Ronnie Howard. She told them how she had in fact stabbed Hinman while Bobby held him, but it was her way of telling the tale that astonished the other women. Just like it was a perfectly natural thing to do every day of the week, Graham would later say. But Sadie had other, more shocking stories to tell. Soon, she was informing her fellow prisoners that she had done the Tate killings as well, once again, on Manson's instructions. The way Sadie told it, two of the girls and a man had also been involved. Virginia Graham's question was the same as the police had asked. Why? Merciless Killers they wanted to do a crime that would shock the world, was Sadie's answer. That the world would have to stand up and take notice. But that wasn't all. Charlie had told them that the family was chosen to go out into the world and release randomly selected people from the earth. Sadie told Graham, you have to have real love in your heart to do this for people. It was she herself who had stabbed the pregnant Sharon Tate. It was like going into nothing going into air, she told Ronnie Howard. Sharon had begged for mercy, begged to be allowed to have her baby. Look, bitch, Sadie had told her, I don't care about you. I don't care if your baby is born or not. You're going to die, and I don't feel anything about it. And the killing itself? It was like a sexual release, was Sadie's description, especially when you see the blood spurting out. It's better than climax. Then Sadie started to tell the story of the next night, at the LaBianca house. It was the family who'd committed that slaughter too, this time with Manson himself in attendance. Normally, the cons code would have prevented Graham and Hart from snitching, but this was just too big and too horrible to keep to themselves. So, after months of fruitless investigation, LAP detectives were suddenly handed the whole case on a plate. From conversations with other family girls and a couple of bikers whom Manson had tried to recruit, they were able to piece together the whole story of the two nights when Manson had tried to start what he called Helter Skelter. 
Manson had preached to his family for two years that a civil war was imminent in America between blacks and whites. It was this war that he called Helter Skelter. While Helter Skelter was in progress, the family would hide in an underground world to which the entrance was in Death Valley. The blacks would be victorious, but when they found themselves unable to run the country, they would invite Manson and the family back to take over. Selecting the Victims On the afternoon of Friday, August 8th, Manson told a group of his selected followers, Now is the time for Helter Skelter. The war was taking too long to happen. It was up to him to get it started. The venue Manson had chosen was a house where record producer Terry Melcher had lived. Manson, who fancied himself as a singer and a guitarist, had nursed hopes that Melcher would give him a record deal. But the main reason for selecting the house seemed to have been because it was isolated, because both Manson and his right-hand man, Charles Tex Watson, knew the layout of the place, having been there to parties on a number of occasions. That evening, Manson gave a knife and his favourite tutu revolver to Tex and told him to go and kill everybody in the house, as gruesome as he could. To help him, Manson selects Sadie, aka Susan Aitkins, and Katie, aka Patricia Krenwinkel, two of his hardcore followers, both just 21 years old, and Linda Kasabian, 20, a newcomer who was the only one in the family with a valid driver's license. He told them to all put on dark clothes and carry knives. Go with Tex, he told the girls, and do whatever he tells you to. Apparently, they had assumed they were going on one of their regular creepy crawling missions, during which they broke into a house at night and moved things around while the occupants slept. But as the group were about to drive away, Manson leaned into the car and added, Leave a sign. You girls know what to write. Something witchy. It was the measure of the extraordinary power Manson held over the family that none of them thought to question him further. They drove into Benedict Canyon and parked outside 10,050 Celio Drive. Tex climbed a telegraph pole outside the house and cut the phone wires. Then, they left the car at the bottom of the hill and returned on foot. Four dark-clad figures scaled the fence and immediately saw the headlights of Steve Perrin's car coming down the drive. Tex told the girls to drop flat. Then he went over, called out halt, and shot the driver four times. Quote, I am the devil. Up at the house, Tex slid a screen in one of the windows and climbed in. He opened the front door and let Sadie and Katie in, too. Linda stayed outside. In the living room, they found a man asleep on the couch. This was Wojtek Frakowski. The man stretched sleepily and asked, What time is it? Then he saw the gun Tex was holding in his face. Who are you? What are you doing here? said Frakowski, alarmed now. I am the devil, was Tex's reply, and I've come to do the devil's business. Then he ordered Sadie to tie the man up. The girls found the other three occupants in the house and brought them at knife point into the living room. All were too shocked to offer any resistance. Tex ordered them to lie face down on the floor. Jay Sebring complained, pointed out Sharon State's condition. Can't you see she's pregnant? Let her sit down. Tex shot him. Then they took the rope Tex had brought and strung Sharon and Abigail Folger up to an overhead beam by their necks. What are you going to do to us? The woman demanded. You were all going to die, said Tex. Frakowski managed to get free from his bonds and a mad struggle ensued. Sadie stabbed repeatedly at the man as they fought. Then, Frakowski ran for the front door. Tex shot him once, then beat him over the head repeatedly with the butt of his gun. Standing outside, Linda saw Tex pursue Frakowski out of the front door and stab him many times on the lawn. Almost simultaneously, Abigail Folger, who had also managed to get free, ran out of the French doors in Sharon Tate's bedroom. She was bleeding profusely. Kitty was after her with a knife upraised. She caught up with Abigail on the lawn and stabbed her until she lay still. In Sadie Mae Glutz's chilling words, Sharon was the last to die. The young actress pleaded for her life. Please don't kill me. I want to have my baby. But the killers were without mercy. 
In the version she told the jury, Sadie claimed that she had held Sharon while Tex stabbed her. But to her prison mates, she said that she herself had stabbed the pregnant woman and then tasted the blood. Wow, what a trip, she told Virginia Graham in the Sybil Brand Institute. To taste death and yet give life. It's warm and sticky and nice. Outside, Sadie found Tex checking that Abigail and Frakowski were dead. He told Sadie to go back inside and write something that will shock the world. Back in the living room, Sadie found the pregnant Sharon still bleeding. I knew there was a living being inside that body, and I wanted to, but I didn't have the courage to go ahead and take it, she testified later. Instead, Sadie took a towel, dipped it in Sharon Tate's blood and wrote, Pig, on the door. Then they left. Linda drove while the others changed out of their blood-soaked clothing. Tex was angry because Sadie had lost her knife. It was this knife that the police found down the back of the chair. The girls complained that their heads hurt from having their hair pulled in the struggle. Katie said her hand was bruised because she kept hitting bone when she stabbed. The bloody clothes were thrown down a hill from Benedict Canyon Road, where police had failed. A TV crew found the bundle four months later. The weapons were similarly disposed of. They stopped on a side street and used a garden hose to wash off any remaining blood. A man came out and tried to stop them, but they got away from him. Later, Rudolph Weber would come forward and say that it was he who had seen the killers that night. Amazingly, he remembered the license plate of the 59 Ford Mercury, GYY 435. Then they drove back to Span Ranch to find Manson waiting where they'd left him. What are you doing home so early? he asked. They told him what they'd done. Boy, said Tex, it sure was helter-skelter. The next evening, the family watched the TV news about the murders they'd committed. Afterwards, Manson told them they were going out again. Only this time, he was coming with them. Last night was too messy, he told them. This time, I'm going to show you how to do it. Quote, I have tied them up. Once again, they took the 59 Ford, this time 17-year-old Clem, Steve Grogan, and 20-year-old Lulu, Leslie Van Houten, came too. They drove around looking for a suitable house at random. They stopped in Pasadena, and Manson got out to take a look. A few minutes later, he was back. He said he saw pictures of children through the window, Sadie later said, and he didn't want to do that house. Finally, they pulled up outside a house where members of the family, including Manson, had been to an acid party a year before. Manson told them to wait. He took a gun and went towards the house next door. I've tied people up, he told the waiting group when he returned some time later. They're very calm. Manson had used the leather thong he habitually wore around his neck to tie Leno LaBianca's hands. Clearly, Manson had told the LaBiancas that they would not be harmed if they cooperated. It was a cruel lie. Now he told Tex, Katie and Lulu to go into the house and paint a picture more gruesome than anybody has ever seen. Then he drove away with the others, telling Tex, Katie and Lulu to hitch back to Span when they'd finished their horrific night's work. Inside, Katie and Lulu took Rosemary LaBianca into the bedroom. When they heard Tex stabbing Leno in the other room, Rosemary started to scream, What are you doing to my husband? Lulu then held her down while Kitty stabbed her. The dying woman's last words were still, What are you doing to my husband? Returning to the living room, Kitty took a carving fork from the drawer, stabbed Lenu Labianka with it several times, then stuck it into his stomach and watched, fascinated, as it waved back and forth. Then she carved the word war into his flesh. When they'd written in blood on the walls and the fridge, they all took a shower, calmly ate watermelon, and drank chocolate milk in the kitchen, then left. Such was the story that the state prosecutor had to tell the jury when the trial of Charles Manson and his followers opened in LA's Halls of Justice on the 24th of July, 1970. Denied access to the court, other female members of the family kept vigil for their messiah on the pavement outside, while Manson did his best to disrupt the proceedings inside. The court refused him permission to conduct his own defense, so he appointed Irving Kanarek, notoriously the most obstructive, long-winded attorney in California. At times, Manson refused to face the judge and was removed from court. 
The night before he faced the jury for the first time, he carved a bloody swastika into his forehead, declaring, I have exed myself from your world. Slavish followers. Whatever he did, the three girls on trial, Sadie, Kitty and Lulu, imitated his every action, thereby proving the prosecution's contention that they were wholly under the influence of the man they believed was Christ, and that though he hadn't struck a blow himself, It was Charles Manson who was chiefly responsible for the Tate and the Bianca killings. Initially, it was to have been Sadie who would testify on how they tried to ignite the war between black and white, Helter Skelter. She had agreed to turn state's evidence in exchange for exemption from the death penalty. But even from prison, using the other girls as go-betweens, Manson was able to reach out and draw her back into the fold. So finally, it was Linda Kasabian, who had only driven the car, who became the prosecution's star witness in exchange for full immunity. Without such a deal, there was no way the DA's office could have got a conviction at all. They had several pieces of evidence, including an alleged remark of Manson's to a member of the Straight Satans that, we knocked off five of them just the other night. They had Tex and Katie's fingerprints inside the tape mansion. By now, they also had a gun and a witness who remembered a number plate. As far as cooperative evidence was concerned, that was about it. But with Linda's testimony, they had enough to get convictions and death sentences for all four defendants, though the sentences were later commuted to life after the gas chamber in California was banned. Quote, watch your own kids. Facing the court with newly shaved heads, the girls spat defiance. Better lock your doors and watch your own kids, Sadie told the jury who had just voted for her death. Manson himself, who, according to one of his disciples, was a changeling who seemed to change every time I saw him, had yet another face for the occasion. His hands trembled and he seemed close to tears. I accept this court as my father, he said meekly. I have always done my best to uphold the laws of my father, and I accept my father's judgment. 